Hi everyone, and welcome to the talk on the rendering retrospective for Manifold Garden. I'm Arthur, I was the lead graphics programmer on Manifold Garden, and I'm presenting today on behalf of everybody from William Shear Studio who worked on the game. So Manifold Garden is an indie game that came out about a year ago on iOS and the Epic Game Store, and is set to release soon on all of the consoles and Steam. So after release, uh, the, the game got picked up and people noticed the sort of interesting and very stylized graphics in the game and we've gotten some questions about how we approach some of these techniques so in this talk i hope to share some little bit little nuggets of knowledge we gained while creating these um vfx so there's sort of three main bits uh, that i want to go into in this talk the first being the wrapped rendering. So this is a really important uh, gameplay aspect of uh, Manifold Garden, that the entire game takes place in so-called toroidal geometry. That is to say, there's some boundary conditions, and when you fall off the end of the level, you start right back at the, the top again, right? So um, how do we render this like infinite toroidal geometry in some efficient way? Well, your very first naive approach might be to simply duplicate the level over and over again, right? In some large grid. And in fact, that's sort of our starting point and we'll kind of cull it away from there to a point that is more efficient to render. So the first thing is that you obviously don't have to move uh, the player through this infinite geometry. Instead, what you can do is as soon as the player leaves one of these cells, we simply teleport them back on to the starting point of the cell and that way creating the illusion that this is some infinite geometry. If you do this just right, there's no visible pop here at all. So this allows us to only keep all the gameplay relevant objects just in the central instance. And all of the other instances around us are simply uh, purely geometry. We also now know beforehand what the maximum visibility of these objects are. So we can uh, cull away any objects or even on a vertex level, uh, things that will never be visible from the central instance, knowing our maximum render distance, etc. So another reason this is faster than you think it might be is that all of these geometries in the wrapped instances are of course the same meshes, which means you can draw them with GPU instancing and you don't even end up with that many draw calls. For further way wraps, uh, we can also start to decimate the meshes and we in our pipeline have an automatic LOD creation uh, that ensures you far away geometry aren't too detailed. For very far away things and for geometries that are intricate but don't have a lot of parallax, we also automatically generate alpha tested billboards and replace the geometry with these proxy billboards. The meta point I want to make here is that this technique is surprisingly naive uh, and you think you might end up with too many vertices. And it's true, we end up with about 20, 25 million vertices uh, even on older iOS devices. So in 2020, vertices are really surprisingly fast, and what kills you are small sub-pixel vertices that cause spurious overdraw. So in Manifold Garden, we mostly just try to take care of these smaller vertices rather than looking at the absolute numbers, and that's in the end what made this uh, technique feasible. So one thing you don't get around with this technique is that there are n cubed, uh, where n is like the side length of this grid, unique instances in the world. So whenever you make a change, you have to propagate that out to all of these n cubed instances. And this does become rather infeasible rather quickly. So instead, what we do for dynamic objects is that we create a tiny GPU driven pipeline, where for the central instance, we submit its data to some compute buffer. Then in the compute shader, we can pretend it's in every real drive cell, do the frustum culling there, and append all the visible instances of this object to this buffer and use an indirect dispatch to then draw all of the real draft objects in a single pass without ever having to really instantiate this object. You might say that we could have used this for every object, which is true, but this there is more work to be done here before this GPU pipeline also supports transparencies and sorting and meshlets and all these other all these other things. Um, as a last point about the wrapped rendering, I want to talk a bit about shadows. Now, shadows don't really make sense in a toroidal geometry anyway, but we decided to approach them as a more traditional shadows where 
the central instance is just shadowed by the geometries around it. That's all well and good, but the problem is, is that that means that your shadow volumes become very large, very fast, that are just filled with geometry. That means that with even rather large shadow maps and good shadow cascades, you still end up with quite alias shadows, which in our very clean aesthetic becomes quite problematic. So one trick we found here is that uh, we can use a so-called cupboard projection for our main directional light. A cupboard projection just means that we align the most significant axes of the directional light with the uh, axes of the texture. So on the left, you can see a shadow map as we would just naively render it and the resulting aliasing. And on the right, we can see that we have aligned the shadow map with the axes of the texture and the reduced aliasing because our geometry mostly is axis aligned anyway. So we can represent it more accurately in this axis aligned shadow map. The second technique I want to talk about are our portals. So every level in Manifold Garden is connected by a portal going between them. And these form these sort of non-Euclidean geometries, right? So the way this works is that we simply render uh, the world recursively in itself. That is to say, we first render our main screen pass and then try to stamp out the portal level behind it and render that just to the parts where the portal is. To do this, we use a uh, classic technique, a stencil buffer. So a stencil buffer just for every pixel has some 8-bit identifier that you can use as a mask. And in our case, we just want to set these 8-bits to the relevant portal ID that we're trying to fill in here. Um, when I say portal ID, we simply chose this as the, you know, the nth portal being rendered would get an ID of n. Right. So how do we actually mark the stencil buffer so that we know where to render which portal. Well, it's tempting here to try to get away with using a pass that does like a stencil increment and as one and maybe when you're done rendering you pop that again and keep it track of that way. But we found that when rendering uh, multiple portals at the same time for arbitrary recursions, there's always bizarre edge cases. And in the end, we instead settled on this two pass approach for stencil buffers. The first pass looks at the stencil buffer and sees if it is the ID that we are currently rendering. And if so, it writes a one to the very first bit, the high bit of the stencil buffer. Then in a second pass, we can read off this high bit and write in whatever portal ID we now need to write in to the lower seven bits. This two pass approach is comes at the cost of this extra pass and we lose one bit, but we have found that this solves every weird edge case with uh, recursive rendering of portals in our stencil buffers. And we do really nicely write in the correct IDs. Lastly, as a bit of a meta engineering point, is that these portals only work when you can easily recursively uh, call your rendering pipeline. That is something that might be easier said than done because a rendering pipeline can quite quickly leave states behind that you don't want it to leave behind or bind variables that you don't want bound anymore. Therefore, for us, it was very important to design this rendering pipeline as something that's very data oriented. Um, to do so, instead of you know, just recursively calling this function, we actually created these render pass stack objects that quite directly specified what exactly needed to be rendered in this render pass with what kind of settings, with what kind of screen area, what kind of stencil IDs, etc. This sort of matches the modern approach Vulkan and DirectX 12 take to render passes. And this data orientedness is actually rather important for successful recursive rendering. The last topic I want to talk about are the edges in Manifold Garden. So these are the sort of outlines, the painterly outlines you can see around geometry and really is what creates the Manifold Garden look in some sense. So on the left you can see this fractal we're running and this fractal really is mostly a simple geometry but these painterly edges make it look like Manifold Garden in a way. So when rendering geometric outlines there's roughly two directions you can go. You can do it as a post-processing effect or try to do it in with specialized geometry with some shader that expands the geometry, for example. We quickly decided, however, that doing it in a geometric way is too limiting for the types of content you can build and is too prone to artifacts. So we wanted to render these outlines purely as a post-processing effect. To do so, you don't you need more than just 
uh, the RGB of the final screen buffer. You also need normal and depth information. So we keep a small side G buffer to store the normals and the depth of our scene. So when you have this normal and depth, uh, it's quite easy to write a naive edge detection shader like we've no, known how to do for a long time. Right? So we, uh, for each pixel, check the neighbors, some four neighborhood in this case, and compare whether the normals or depths of any pixel are too different. And if they are, we say this pixel is an edge, right? That's simple enough, but it immediately presents you with two problems. The first is that you cannot just compare depths of two pixels. If there's some plane parallel to the camera, for example, there's a totally valid reason to have a gradient in the depth that should not cause an edge. The second problem is, is that it's aliases terribly. You can imagine that these lines in some sense are infinitely thin, have some infinite Nyquist frequency, and um, because the edges are also symmetric, if there is a pixel, if there is an edge from pixel A to pixel B, there's also an edge from pixel B to pixel A, we're effectively rendering these edges at a quarter resolution, so it, um, which means it aliases just terribly. So let's fix the first problem first and get a better definition of when something is an edge. We propose to fit a plane to the central pixel and for every neighbor check if the normal has some angle, some greater than some angle alpha uh, normal away from this plane or if the projected distance to this plane, world space distance, is too large. This geometric definition is a lot more intuitive for what it means to be an edge. And given that most of the geometry in Manifold Garden is flat, the definition of measuring the distance to the nearest plane is, works really well. For curved geometry, you might imagine that instead of fitting a plane to the central pixel, you might fit a sphere uh, to the central pixel, depending on the curvature of the neighboring pixels. Right? But for Manifold Garden, this was not necessary. And just the first order plane fitting works surprisingly well. Secondly, we want to address the aliasing. So to do that, I want to define it a bit better what it means to be an edge. Rather than saying a pixel is an edge, we would want to talk about that there is an edge between two pixels, right? And every pixel has some distance to this edge. Or put in a different way, every pixel has some distance to the nearest edge. If that definition sounds familiar, it's because it is. It's exactly the definition of a sine distance field. A sine distance field is some implicit uh, representation of a geometry where every pixel stores the nearest distance to this geometry. The advantage of formulating the edges like this rather than a binary yes-no for an edge is that there's well-known techniques for rendering anti-alias sine distance fields that we can then use to render out this distance field. The second advantage is that we're no longer restricted to just determining edges between, say, the four neighborhood, but we can calculate the distance to the edges for arbitrarily large neighborhoods in some sense. Right? In fact, this definition isn't restricted to having samples on a grid anymore either. These samples can be just distributed anywhere, really. For us, that's an advantage because Manifold Garden can render with multi-sample anti-aliasing where every pixel has a few subsamples with unique values stored in them. Now, instead of determining if there's an edge between two pixels, we can determine for each subsample, for every other subsample, if there is an edge between them, and store the minimum distance for every subsample, essentially storing this sign distance field at the full MSAA resolution. We can then render this multi-sample anti-alias design distance field and get rid of a lot more of the aliasing. It's worth noting here that this definition now relies heavily on the exact positioning of the subsamples in the pixel. And the specifications often don't align with where they are actually placed according to GPU manufacturers. So for us, we simply query these positions on the startup of the game and store them in some texture somewhere. So if you heard that and cringed a little and thought that might be too slow, you're right, that is quite slow and it is a rather brute force method. So to make that feasible, we need two more observations. The first is that edges are rather sparse. So most pixels that we are rendering to the screen are not edges and we therefore don't need a very precise distance. We just need, we just need to know they aren't an edge. The second is that we can uh, abuse the fact that these edges are symmetric. Right. And in fact, we're going to go a step beyond that and say that these edges are transitively symmetric. 
So if there's no edge between pixel A and B, and there's no edge between pixel B and C, we'll determine there's no edge between pixel A and C even, right? The way what we can do now is if you look at the image on the right of the screen, is to make these three by three blocks and simply do nine comparisons for the central pixel to perhaps determine that all of these pixels are the same if there's no edge between them. Then with three more comparisons, we can link up all these bigger blocks. And if we don't find any differences there, we can say that this entire block does not have an edge. This way with about nine times less comparisons, we can quickly determine for three by three blocks of pixels that there is no edge in there at all. What this gives you in the end is some mask where we know that we only need to check in the white regions for exact sign distances. And in the black regions, we can skip the expensive calculations entirely. And again, this mask is very fast to calculate as opposed to doing the full anti-aliased uh, edges. So if you put all that together, I can run this video. And on the left, you can see the edges as they were in 2015 using the traditional four neighborhood simple edges. And on the right are all the new methods combining everything, including multi-sample anti-aliasing to really render clean, stable edges with little artifacts. As a last note about all of these techniques is I want to talk a bit about performance configuration as a bit of a pet peeve of mine. So all of these techniques come with a tons of knobs and dials you can tweak to trade off rendering cost. And that forms like some very high dimensional space of settings. Some people will just expose these to the user and expect them to, for 20 settings, pick if they want it to be high or very high or, or something. And we don't think that's reasonable. Really users just care about two axes here. One, the, the fidelity of the final rendered image and two, the cost to render that fidelity, right? What we can then do is in this very high dimensional space, just pick a few points that we say come out favorably on this rendering to fidelity cost graph. And in fact, we can then use performance tests to make sure that the rendering cost between each of these profiles is roughly spaced out. This provides a much better performance configuration than just the usual defaults of high and very high. And we created about 15 profiles this way that devices can switch between or we assign to some flavor of an iPhone, for example, to make sure it runs well. So what are some of the takeaways from this talk here? Uh, one is that the vertices are actually surprisingly cheap in the right circumstances and you can get away with a lot as long as you make sure that you aren't killed by tiny sub-pixel triangles that cause a lot of spurious overdraw. Second is that having a data-oriented pipeline can allow for much greater flexibility and is not just an engineering note. Um, second, thirdly, is that a two-pass tensile preparation approach can be more flexible than trying to use tensile increments or some of these more traditional techniques and this cost of an extra rendering pass is mostly negligible. And lastly, is that handling custom Handling MSAA subsamples in a custom fashion can be really powerful to render anti-aliasing with MSAA enabled for different types of effects. So that is all. Uh, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out to me at my email or Twitter or whatever. And thank you for listening.